We are continuing our message series and a theme that we've had for uh, the beginning of this year, and that is that God's will is for you and I to thrive, that he has so much more for us than just trying to get by and just surviving. And certainly there are times in our life when we're knocked down by life circumstances and trials, when we feel overwhelmed and we're burdened with the different responsibilities that we have, but certainly it is God's will that we thrive past all of that. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at uh, the different ways that God wants us to do that. And we've been highlighting the fact that we need to have certain goals. We've talked about having the goal of dedication, that we want to make it the goal of our life to be dedicated to God. Uh, we've talked about the goal of being diplomatic in our relationships because one of the major stress bearers in our lives is how we deal with people in our life, especially those that might be uh, difficult to deal with. And so we've covered a number of different goals, uh, but I would like to put a bookmark and a bookend on this series by sharing this last important goal with you this morning, and that is the goal of diligence, that God requires for you and I to be a diligent people. But this is something we see across life. If you want to be good in your studies, well, you have to be diligent to prepare for the exam and the class load that's ahead of you. If you want to perform well on the job, well, there has to be a diligence to how you carry yourself. That might mean being punctual on your arrival. That might be, mean being on time with the, the deadlines that are placed before you. Uh, think about if you're an athlete. You need to be diligent in how you prepare, how you train. Today I hear there's a big game going on later today. Well, these athletes that have made it this far, um, they don't just step between the lines of the football field and all of a sudden it all comes together. There has been years of practice that has gone in, and in particular for this team that they're on right now, there have been thousands of hours that have been invested into diligently being the player that they are and being the team that they are. It would be a huge mistake for anybody who's on that playing field not to study their playbook. In fact, uh, the playbook is a major part of preparing for the game, the game film. You know, what we see on Sunday is just a microcosm of what takes place during the week for these players. And as we watch the football season culminate and come to an end in this, this big stage, this big game, don't forget that it has been diligence that has led these teams to this place. And even the coaches and their staff. Years ago, uh, when folks played football, when guys played football, it was just really a six-month gig. And then you went back, and some of them worked other jobs. Some of them served the country uh, like the other sports. But professional sports, especially football, has become a 12-month commitment, especially for the coaches, diligence. And so while all the commercials will go off and all the pomp and circumstance, uh, they have gotten there because there was a certain price to be paid, and that price was diligence. They're able to try for this big game because of the diligence that they've put forth. The same is true in your spiritual life. You know, we don't just snap our fingers and all of a sudden that we are spiritually mature. I know there are some that try to put out these false teachings, these false theology. Hey, you know what? You just got to think it into being and it'll happen or just say it and things will start to go your way. And life doesn't work that way. I mean, if we're going to think that way, you know, somebody might have to give us a drug test if that's how we're going to think because that's just simply ridiculous. It requires a diligent pursuit of God. And what's going to happen in your life as you diligently pursue God, that will spill over into the other important areas of your life. Uh, your family, your job occupation, the dreams that you want to reach, whether you're young or you're old, it doesn't matter. That if you make this commitment to say, I want to diligently pursue God, it will bless your life. And so the goal of diligence is this. I will put forth a diligent effort in all that I do. See, if you could say, I'm going to diligently follow God, that's going to help you be diligent in other areas of your life. It's going to help you in every area of your life if you can make that commitment. And so diligence is a pathway to thriving in all areas of life. You want to thrive in your marriage? Well, you want to have that diligent relationship with God. You want to thrive in business? Well, you want to have this diligent relationship with God. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be great if you're diligent following God. Nobody's saying that. But it does mean that you're going to come closer to God. You're going to have wisdom. You're going to know His promises. And that is what you need as you make it through this life. Now, we started this series off by talking about a certain king who was dedicated to God. 
and durable uh, in his relationship with God. And I want to end this message series as we uh, bring this Thrive series to a close by talking about another king in the Old Testament, and that is King Josiah. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. As you find your place there, we're going to focus our attention on verses 29 down to the end of the chapter. But let me just give you a context, and the best way to do that for this particular passage is just to read about this king. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 34, 2 Chronicles, let me read to you some information about this king, King Josiah. He's not like any other king you've ever met. This is what it says here. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. That's pretty young to become a king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2 tells us something very interesting about his character. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. From eight years old. And he walked in the ways of his father David. And he notice this. He did not turn aside to the right hand, to the right hand or to the left. So he, he walked a straight line. He didn't go to the right or the left. He was, he was balanced in his walk with God. Now, verse 3, as he gets older, for in the eighth year of his reign, and so basically from 8 to now 16, uh, you know, maybe he was watching cartoons, uh, playing Little League baseball, things that kids do. But now he's 16, and in the 16th year now of his life, while he was still young, because 16 is still young, he began, notice this, very important for the context of where we're going today, he began to seek God. You're never too young or too old or too lousy of a person to start seeking God. You know, some of us think, you know what, if we're younger here today or you're watching, you know, when I get older, I'll start seeking God. You know, I'll make a few mistakes. You know, you don't want to do that because those mistakes could cost you your freedom. They could cost you your hair. You get real nervous over the things you do. They could cost you a lot of money. They could cost you your freedom. And so uh, check this out. He began to seek the Lord when he was 16 of his father David. And then in the the 12th year, now he's 20, he began to purge Judah. So now that word purge is very rich with meaning to where we're going. Purge means he began to do a house cleaning because the people of this particular region of Judah and Jerusalem, they, it says as we go on, they began to worship, they they were so controlled by worshiping the false god of Baal. And the false god of Baal first originated He was the supreme god of uh, the the Canaan people and the Phoenicians, and he was the god of fertility, a false god as we know, but this false idolatry worship infiltrated uh, the ranks of the Jewish believers, we find out in Judges chapter 3 verse 7, and then in 1 Kings chapter 16 under the reign of the evil King Ahab, it became full-blown that people were worshiping Baal. And so now as Josiah comes on the scene, notice now he's a young man who's seeking God, and a direct result of seeking God, when you see God, you realize there are things that need to change if they're not right in your life. He notices something very interesting, that his people are not thriving. If anything, they're barely getting by, they're surviving, because the root cause of their problem was that they were worshiping a false god. And so what he notices here is because he's seeking God, it goes hand in hand. Seeking God, automatically you start to see things that don't belong in your life. You notice that in your own life. As you came to Christ, there were things you never even considered to be wrong, but you realize, wait a minute, that needs to change. That needs to go. And all of a sudden, uh, you began to do some house cleaning. It's kind of like when you know, maybe in your house you get something new. This happens all the time to us, right? We get maybe a new chair or a new piece of furniture or a new TV, and so we might get something new, and all of a sudden we start cleaning the rest of the house. That's what we do sometimes. And all of a sudden we realize, well, this needs to go, and that needs to be put in this, this needs to be put away. And that's what happens when Christ comes into your heart. Uh, You begin to have this desire to want to thrive. You're done with just surviving in life. You want to thrive. And Josiah is now seeking God, and he wants his people to thrive as he is. And so what he's doing is he's purging. He's going to remove the garbage that doesn't need to be there. And so as we go on in this chapter, we find out that something very interesting happens. In all of that false worship, they lost what they had at the time to be the Word of God. 
which as we study history, we find out was portions of the book of Exodus and all of Deuteronomy. They were so caught up in their, their idolatry that they lost the Bible of what they had it then. That happens in our culture. When we're so caught up in our selfishness, we can lose sight of God. That's what happened here. Now, in the process of purging and, and going into the temple and reclaiming it for God, they find the Word of God. And as they find the Word of God, one of the prophets interprets and reads it, and what they find out is that judgment is coming. Even though Josiah is purging the land, judgment is going to come if they don't get their act together. And so as we come to verse 29 of 2 Chronicles 34, our primary text this morning, we're going to find out about what it means to be diligent. And so coming here to verse 29, now we have a full picture here. It says this, Then the king, that's Josiah, sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem together. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites of the Levites, and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had, notice, had been found in the house of the Lord. Again, that's what happens sometimes when we're not seeking God, we lose sight of God and His Word. When we're seeking false versions of security or even false versions of God. Now, the Word of God has been found in the house of the Lord. Verse 31, then the king, that's Josiah, stood in the place and made a covenant, which is a promise, a commitment before God, before the Lord. Notice now, here's our key word here, to follow the Lord. Now, you want to underline that word, to follow the Lord. When you think about your life as a Christian today, uh, now some 2,000 plus years after the cross, after the resurrection, after the Lord walked this earth physically, when you think of your life as a Christian, after you put, place your faith in Christ, you come to faith in Christ, by his, all by His grace, by the way, the most important responsibility for you is not to try to be perfect. The most important responsibility you have is to follow Christ, to be a faithful follower. But as you follow Christ, you want to then help build more followers of Christ. In essence, that's what Josiah is doing here. He has sought God, and as he sought God, he, in his own life, he's purged his own life. Now he's purging the region, and now that he's purging the region, he is leading people into a covenant promise to follow God, because that's what's most important in your life, that you would be committed to following God. Now, there is a term that I want to share with you today that is connected to being diligent. In fact, it's something we should do diligently. You want to write this down. Diligently seek God. In your walk with God, you want to diligently seek God. You don't just want to haphazardly seek God. See, here in the Northeast, people leave the seeking of God up to, I'll tell you what it is, a few things, because I used to do it, communions, weddings, or funerals. That's about the only time after somebody goes to church, after their parents tell them they have to come with them, and then they get older and they don't want to go anymore, that's about the extent of seeking God that people have when there's a family event or when there's a tragedy. That's about all that their, their seeking of God comes to, or when we're in a jam, or when we get pulled over by the car, oh, Lord, please, oh, or maybe we go through one of these communist cameras here on Highland Boulevard or someplace else. And, oh, I pray that it didn't pick me up. Lord God, you know, um, you know, that's about the extent of our seeking God. But it needs to be so much more than that because God wants to bless those who seek Him. He wants to reward those who seek Him. Notice what it says here in your notes in Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. We're told for. He who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. Not who sometimes seek him. Not who just when they're in. And by the way, God loves when you come to him when you're in a jam, but that, don't let that be the only time you knock on his door. Diligently seek him. The pathway to thriving with God is diligently seeking him. Now, being that today's the Super Bowl, you're going to see a ton of commercials that are going to be on. But one of my favorite commercials was a playoff of the 2000 uh, drama starring Tom Hanks uh, titled Castaway. How many of you remember that movie? Okay. I think that movie really hits home for us because we're on an island ourselves and we might feel like we're a castaway. Well, in the movie, Tom Hanks plays a man by the name of Chuck Nolan. He is this obsessively, um, you know, punctual FedEx executive. 
and he's en route to Malaysia when the plane crashes. He's the only survivor along with a couple of boxes, and he finds himself on this island. Now, while he's on this island, you know that he's doing everything in his power to survive. At the end of the movie, he has a, one of the boxes that uh, survived the crash. He winds up taking it after he makes his way out of there, and he delivers the package. How about the irony of that? And as he delivers the package, you know, he brings it to the woman. Now, the commercial, you probably remember it, uh, takes us to Hanks, or what it would be Tom Hanks, Chuck Nolan, asking what was in that box. You know, sometimes we wonder, you know, we're, we're trying to survive, and we're trying to get through our day. We're trying to make it on this island that we feel like we're a castaway on. And we're wondering, I mean, how am I going to make it? And, and we don't need to open the box. We need, to, we need to open the Bible. And we need to remember what God has given to us. We need to remember his promises. And, you know, just like Chuck Nolan, you know, we'll be surprised what's in the Bible. You know, think about that, a satellite phone. That would have solved all his problems right there. Okay? Seeds. You know, what's in God's word for you and I is the main way to communicate to God. It's the old, forget about a satellite phone, it's a, it's a dimensional phone. You can learn how to pray and communicate with a holy God from his word. When you think about the word of God, it has seeds of faith. I mean, how can you possibly have faith? Some of you might be saying, this guy, when's he going to get done with this? I just want to get home and get to my Super Bowl party. None of this really makes sense. Hey, this is all just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. No, it's not. Hold on. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. Our ability to have seeds of faith is not our power to just believe because this is not a fairy tale. Rather, it's from the word of God. The more you open up God's word and seek him, notice through his word. Not through counterfeit experiences of other people, not from false teachings like Baal or other false worships that are out there today that promise you that everything's going to go your way. That's not legitimate. What is legitimate is the Word of God, which is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And like Chuck Nolan, we got to open, we got to open our box. We got to open the Bible. And we got to see what's there. We got to realize what God has for us. That as we seek him diligently, we will find him. In fact, that's what the Lord said. A number of times he said, test me. Come seek me. Come after me. Guess what? You will find me. We must realize that God, all God requires you to do is to do it diligently. Let's stop playing games. Listen, we're, we've been marooned on this island of Staten right here. And it's crazy. People drive crazy. People fight over parking spaces in Costco like it's Armageddon. A storm is going to come. They ravage shells. I mean, this is a crazy place to live. People are upset and angry all the time. We're missionaries here. You don't got to get on a plane and go overseas. You just got to come to Staten Island. You're a missionary here. That's why everybody leaves. And, and think about our culture here. We're getting ticketed to death, taxed to death, told to death. Who would want to be here? God has you here for a reason. And he wants you to diligently seek him on this island you've been marooned on because he wants you, like Josiah, to purge what's in your own life first and then to help purge your culture so that people could come to follow God like you need to follow God. It's so important. Now, how do you do that? A couple of how-tos here so we're literally on the same page. First of all, do it genuinely. As you look at the context of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we, we hear about Enoch earlier in chapter 11, how he walked with God, and then God took him up. He was no more. He didn't have a normal death. God just took him up. That's a neat way to go. I wouldn't mind going that way. Hey, where's Ray? I don't know. He's no more. He's gone. And God just took him up. That's a nice way to go. Enoch walked with God so closely. That's a beautiful thing to be attributed to your life, that you are walking with God. In fact, that's true prosperity, John says, that my children are walking with God. That's God, the heart of God, that we would be spiritually prospering in such a way. And so genuinely, Enoch walked with God. Jesus said, I'm looking for those who worship in spirit and truth. Again, genuinely. How about prayerfully? We're to prayerfully seek God. Prayer is so important to your life. And as you open up God's word, you realize that he wants you to communicate with him openly, obediently. God wants us to obediently seek after him. That doesn't mean, God, I'm going to pick and choose what's in your word. No, God, I'm going to apply what you have to say. And there are going to be some things that rub me the wrong way, but I'm glad. You know, what if you went to the doctor and he lied to you all the time? 
But meanwhile, your blood work says something different. Somebody else read it. Your doctor said this? Your doctor said that you should keep going to White Castle every day? What? You're about to have a heart attack. You get a new doctor. Some of us might need to get a new source of encouragement because really we're being, we're being led down a road that's going to lead to, to more confusion. As we see God, you can bet your bottom dollar there are going to be some things that come to clashes and head to head in your life, things that need to be purged, things that need to be removed, so you can follow God just like King Josiah is saying to do. And then, of course, attentively. I, I can't believe how many times in God's Word, and I, I copied some of these verses down, they're pretty amazing. How many times God says to diligently listen to Him? You ever, as parents, sometimes that's the cry of our heart. We're like a broken record to our children. No matter how, you know, how, how they are or what home they grow up in, you just want them to listen to you. Can you just listen? Diligently listen. So you can't listen if you have earbuds in your ears. That's a little hard to listen that way. But that's how we are with God. We're going, God, speak to me, but meanwhile, you know, we got our wireless you know, earphones on, and we're doing 150 other different things. We certainly have a divided attention, but God wants us to listen to him. This is what he said in Job 21.2, hear diligently my speech, and let this be your consolations. He said that twice to Job. Diligently listen to the Lord. You want to diligently listen. In order to diligently listen, you might need to remove some distractions. Here's one of the best ways to improve your listening to God. Turn the TV off. I mean, it's amazing. Step away from the phone for just a moment, and you could hear more from God as you open up His Word. This is how we are to diligently seek the Lord. It's so very important that we are doing that. Because as we transition to our next point, borrowing from another king of the Bible, it says this in 2, Kings, in 2 Chronicles rather 12, 14, this of King Rehoboam, he did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Notice that. He got, this king got himself in trouble because he didn't take time to seek God. King Josiah kept his nose clean. The Bible tells us that he was devoted to God. That's why no calamity that was prophesied came upon him or his family because he sought the Lord. Notice the contrast. This other king, he got into all types of trouble because he didn't set time to seek the Lord. So there's a choice in the matter. We must choose to seek God so that we could protect ourselves from evil. In fact, write this second principle down. As we diligently seek God, another pathway to diligence and thriving with God is this. Diligently safeguard yourself from evil. Just by a show of hands, how many people lock their door at night? Okay. Anybody have an alarm that sets it? Sure. Okay. Who has a shotgun? No, you don't got to raise your hand for that. It may not be ready. To, but uh, you protect your home. You safeguard your family. You love your family. You know, I heard of a man one time, he had, he had a, a younger daughter, and she was, she was the only uh, girl at home, and so her boyfriend came over, and um, he, he was a collector of guns, and he introduced her boyfriend to her two older brothers. It was shotgun one and shotgun two. And he said, don't step out of line, son. Things, people do things a little bit different in other parts of the country, which I admire sometimes. <laughs> Uh, to put a fear in somebody. But here's the thing. We go to great lengths to safeguard the people we love, the things we love, our life. Isn't nothing wrong with that. We need to safeguard our heart from evil. We need to be careful. You know, it says in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart. We must guard our heart from evil. And that is what is being portrayed here because the, these people of Judah and Jerusalem had done a lousy job at that. They were worshiping the false god of Baal, setting up wooden images, so much so that they lost sight of God's word, perverted the temple. And so now uh, Josiah is putting forth this covenant to be diligent in their relationship with God. Diligently safeguard yourself from evil. And this is how to do it. The second part of verse 31 says this of 2 Chronicles 34. And to keep, that's a key word there, keep. You want to circle that. To keep his commandments and his testimonies. Now I love those, those three words there, keep, which gives us the understanding of protecting, of diligence. And his commandments and testimonies, and notice his statutes, add that in there as well. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, and it's filled with statements of God's commands, his statutes. 
his principles, his priorities, his testimonies. And here Josiah is saying that we need to keep ultimately the word of God. That the way of safeguarding our heart and our soul is through the word of God. Now, As you flip over your notes, you'll notice a couple of how-tos here. First of all, we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan in how we are going to overcome evil in our life. Because evil is going to come. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says to make every effort to abstain from evil. That we're to do the best job we can to keep ourselves away from evil. And so here's a plan. Do you, here's, a, here's a thought here. Do you have a plan to keep yourself from evil? Well, one of the main plans you can have is to have a daily intake of God's word in your heart and in your life. Uh, as you do that, that will help you to know the tricks of the enemy, to beware of the lies that are out there. But we have to take a stand. We have to realize that God wants to do a work in our life, but we need to have a daily intake of his word. Secondly, we need to choose a path. There's a path. There's two paths that you could choose. Either you could choose the path that leads to, to more trouble and more evil, or you could choose the path that God has for you. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says this, Do not do as the wicked do, and don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving. And so we need to choose a path. We need to have a plan, but we need to choose a path. If you're going to safeguard your heart from evil, there needs to be a path that you're going to choose. And that path is paved with the Word of God. You want to have a daily intake of God's Word in your heart. Now, I shared this once before, but a pastor told his new convert this, I'm going to teach you how to steal, drink, and lie. Steal time out of every day to read God's Word, drink from its clear, refreshing waters, and lie on your bed at night and prayerfully meditate on what you read. That is what God wants us to be doing on a daily basis. You know, we don't need to go to a seminar or we don't need to go on a plane somewhere and figure this out. God has already shared with you and I the ways to safeguard our heart from evil. But evil is going to come. It's going to be there. Now, what should you be safeguarding your heart from? What particular evils? Let me just give you a few. First of all, you've got to safeguard your heart from false teaching. You could expect that this is going to be a part of life. There's going to be false teaching. Now, in Jude chapter, as we, actually as we read Jude holistically, we find out, it says this, that the word of God has been around. It's been handed down by the saints. What you will notice about false teaching is, is that it's always this new and latest way to follow God. And so here's a saying, if it's new, it's not for you. Just remember it that way. You know, there's people, they're always going to have this, this new movement's coming from Canada. This new movement's coming from overseas. Good, you keep your new movement. I'm going to go with the Word of God. I'm going to go with God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I don't need something new. I don't need brother so-and-so to give me his latest this or that. I got the Word of God. That's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on the very words, the very revelation of God Almighty. I think there's a lot of people who mean well, but they get caught up in, as they, in, their, in wanting to be their own version of God. And wanting everybody to worship them. And that's just not how is it to be. No matter who it is, a missionary, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, we're just messengers of God. That's all we are. Nobody's better than anybody. Hey, listen, we're all a team. God calls some to do this and some to do that. We're all a part of the body of Christ. What we all have to realize is, is we follow His revelation, not somebody else's revelation. We need to be crystal clear on that. We need to safeguard ourselves from false teaching. We also need to safeguard ourselves, I alluded to this earlier, from other people's spiritual, uh, counterfeit spiritual experiences that they say they have. Some people, they may, you think they make up stories of, you ain't heard nothing yet, the things I've heard through the years. We need to realize that God will never contradict His Word. And that's always a way to find out, okay, is this real or is this not? And so I want to safeguard myself from that. I also want to safeguard myself from temptation. There's going to be temptation. You know, the Air Force has a saying, you catch no flack unless you're over the target. As you are doing what God has called you to do, you could expect to be shot at. It's going to happen. Write it down. Also, keep this in mind. Often, where there is spiritual progress, there is spiritual warfare. It's going to happen. The enemy is looking to bring you down. It's just a part of life. And we need to realize that we need to safeguard ourselves. That we need, to, we need to run hard for God. We need to beware of, of the lion, the devil, who's a roaring lion looking to seek who he may devour. 
Reminds me of a story I heard about Bernard Kip Lagat. He's a world-class runner from Kenya. And it says during the Sydney Olympics, an interview asked him how his country was able to produce so many long-distance great runners. With, with clever wit, Lagat told the African strategy for motivating success in runners. He said this, it's the road signs that we see. Beware of lions. And that produces great runners, he says. I mean, I don't think we need to go hang and beware of lion signs all over Staten Island, but we need to realize that the enemy is at our, our heels here. And we need to beware of the lion that wants to bring us down. We need to beware of that temptation. Another thing to safeguard yourself from is getting uh, just thrown under the bus by your adversaries. There's going to be a lot of adversaries around. Um, it's just going to be. Actually, in 1 Corinthians, which comes to mind, in chapter 16, verse 9, Paul said that the door is wide open, but there are many adversaries. So even as you serve God and you're doing the right thing, even as you're trying to live right, maybe you've come to Christ, you're trying to turn this over to God, expect there to be adversaries. You know, again, the, the problem with the false teaching of today is they try to tell everybody, you know what, you just say your prayers and eat your vitamins and everything's going to go your way. That infuriates me because that's not true and that discourages people. That's counterfeit. Actually, what's true is what Paul said. Yeah, the door's open, but there's adversaries. There's going to be temptation. You might be tempted more. You might be discouraged more because you're over the target, because you're doing the right thing. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Keep being diligent by safeguarding your heart in God. Proverbs 11.27 says this, He who earnestly seeks good finds favor. I like that. But trouble will come to him who seeks evil. We have a choice. So it's free will, your greatest blessing and your greatest curse. Are you going to choose the path that leads to goodness and God's favor? Or are we going to choose to multiply our stupidity and our trouble? Beware of those lions. Run hard after God. Run the race, as Paul said. Don't skip along the race. Run the race. Don't lollygag it. Diligently run the race that God has for you. Write this third principle down. Diligently stand firm in your faith. I mentioned earlier that as you follow God, again, this is not a fairy tale. This is real life stuff. This will help you in other areas of your life. If you want to have the confidence to be a good athlete, the confidence to make the grade, the confidence to make the sale, the confidence in the classroom, the confidence in the boardroom, the confidence in your relationships that you need to have, the confidence to carry yourself, there's nothing wrong with that, to carry yourself in a way of integrity and honor, to be successful in this life, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as that doesn't come at the sacrifice of your character for Christ. As long as God is first and center in your life. As, you, as some of you who are here today, you're younger, have those dreams of being this or that. And don't let anybody tell you different. But remember, first and foremost, stand firm in your faith. It goes on to say this, uh, young Josiah. Again, Josiah 8, 16, seeking God. 20, you know, basically remodeling the whole place here. It says this, going back to our scripture here now in verse 31, the last part of it to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. Again, this book is the word of God that was lost, and it was portions of Exodus, all of Deuteronomy, and it says this, and he made all who were present, this is the king now, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin, notice, to take a stand. you got to take a stand in life. We're standing for something. Are you standing for yourself? Or are you standing for God? Here's a hint. You could stand for yourself, but you're going to fall down then for God and for other people. But when you stand for God, you'll be able to stand for your children, stand for your spouse, uh, stand for your family, stand for your, your dreams and your goals when you stand for Christ and you stand for God. You want to take a stand. And maybe for you that stand like Josiah is saying, you know what, no more. I'm purging my life of this. People make excuses all the time. Oh, I just can't stop this, and I just can't stop that. Let's just adjust the speech there. You just don't want to stop this or stop that. A lot of psychology in recent years has come out, and I share with you my opinion on this. Oh, little, little, little Ray does this because he don't, he don't love himself enough. No, little Ray does this because he loves himself too much. He doesn't love God enough. That's the problem. And the closer I get to God, like Josiah, the more stupid I realize I am. And the quicker I want to confess my heart to God and stand firm in my faith so I don't go backwards. 
Listen, God is no respecter of persons. He don't look at me differently than he looks at you. We need his grace the same way. But we stand firm in his faith the same way as well. If we're going to stand firm, if we're going to move forward. But we got to diligently do it. we got to stand firm. we got to realize that we are going to be shot at. We are going to get knocked down. But we got to take the way that God provides for us to stand firm and to get up. Heard the story of a U.S. Air Force pilot, Scott O'Grady, who was shot down over Bosnia in the 1990s. He evaded capture for days until he was found by a rescue helicopter. When the helicopter landed to rescue him, he summoned all his strength and fought through the bushes to get to a place of refuge. When asked by his comrades, how did you make it? He just said, I, I laid low until it was my time to stand again. And maybe for you, you've been knocked down a little bit in life. You've been shot down. You just keep crawling to refuge and safety. You keep trusting God, and by His grace, you will stand again. But you got to stand firm. you got to have that heart and that goal and say, I'm going to diligently stand for Christ. I'm going to diligently stand again. And that was the heart of Josiah here. He encouraged everybody to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem, we're turning now, now verse 32, did according to the covenant of God the God of their fathers. And so now they're returning. This is nothing new here. God had previously prescribed to live this way. This is nothing new under the sun. God had already said, this is how they're to live. Verse 33, thus Josiah removed, that reattaches it back to purging again, all the abominations, and oh, there were many abominations, from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel. Josiah took a stand. He called for the people to take a stand. How do we take a stand? Well, practice here. You'll notice we got to keep practicing the truth, keep practicing standing firm. Psalm 119.11 says this, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. we got to keep practicing the word of God. You know, it goes back to that, doesn't it? That's what was lost. That was the missing ingredient here for these people. And when it comes to you and I diligently pursuing God, when it comes to myself having to make a business decision, and I make the wrong decision, it's because I wasn't, I wasn't resting in God's wisdom enough. It's so important that we realize that God has wisdom from his word for us. How about Jesus when he was being tempted? What did he do? He could have easily vanquished the devil. He would have been no more. He could have called for legions of angels. What did he do? He didn't do any of that. What did he did do? He did this. He quoted scripture back at the enemy. You stand firm again through the word of God. That's the practice you want to have. And then purpose. You want a purpose in your heart that you're not going to do whatever evil, you're not going to go down whatever path that you don't need to go down. I'm reminded of Joseph in the book of Genesis 39. Uh, You remember that story well when Potiphar's wife came to him and invited him to have this, uh, this affair with her. And what did Joseph say to her? Even though the husband was out, the, any witnesses were gone. It was the perfect opportunity. Perhaps it could have meant in the worldly sense he would have went even higher in power and finance if he would have had now the favor of the wife. But he didn't care about any of that. What did he say? How could I do this evil to my master and more importantly, before God? That's what he called it. See, that's what you do. You got to call a spade a spade in life. You know, some of us, we want to give evil different names. We got to call a spade as evil is evil. And that's what Joseph did. He was able to stand firm. Because he diligently sought the Lord. And we find out through his life, and the Lord was with him. Like Josiah, the Lord was with him. See, there is a great reward. As it says, God rewards those who diligently seek him. God will cause you to make it through your trial when you're seeking him. Now, nowhere does the Bible promise you're going to be a millionaire if you seek God diligently. That's erroneous that people teach that way. But it does promise that the God of heaven is with you that he will never leave you nor forsake you. The God of heaven promises that he will provide for all of your needs according to his riches in heaven. He promises that. So as you take a stand from, you know, for some of us, even if we've known the Lord for a good many years, we, we, we never stop taking a stand. Each and every day you take a stand. The great Margaret Thatcher once said, in order to be victorious, you've got to take a new stand each day. And sometimes it's the same stand each day. Well, that's temptation. Each day, we've got we to gotta remind ourselves what it says in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. King Josiah returned worship to the word of God. 
and now he's calling people to stand firm. God wants you to stand firm too. Stand firm in the promises that God has shared with you through his word. See, the enemy is going to try to discourage you that you're not good enough, that you're too this, you're too that. Unless you've got a letter from heaven saying that, you have no reason to believe that. Believe in God's promises. Trust in what he has confirmed to you, his calling for your life, what he has called you to do. Don't let the warfare that goes on around you or the drama that goes on around you discourage you. Rather, see it as a confirmation that you are over the target. And you keep standing firm in the word of God and in his promises. And this last part of diligence I want to share is for you and I as well. God wants us to diligently seek him. He wants us to diligently safeguard ourselves from evil. Diligently take a stand and stand firm, of course, in his word. But he wants us to diligently serve him. Write that down. Diligently serve God. Diligently serve him. There's no greater call of your life than to serve God. Now, I used to think growing up, well, in order to serve God, you know, you kind of had to have these three letters in front of your name. I found out they were abbreviation, but Rev, R-E-V, or a white collar. Um, I look in the mirror as I was just checking my hair. You know, I look like I have a collar on today, but I don't. Um, this, is just, this is my Under Armour shirt here uh, today, and I just happen to have this one. But I was thinking you, know, you used to have a white collar to serve, and you, need, you know, God has called all of us to serve, children, adults, that all of us have been called to serve God. Because as you attach yourself to saying, God, I want to serve you, guess what? You're going to serve yourself less. You're going to be committed to God more. 2 Chronicles 34, 33, the last part of our scripture this morning, it says this, and Josiah made all who were present in Israel, underline this, diligently serve the Lord their God. Diligently serve the Lord their God. Diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart. Now that is, that's a remarkable leadership tenure right there. All his days they did not depart. We need to elect this guy for president here. Uh, all his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. Josiah had set such an example that his life was such an example of thriving through diligence that all who were with him followed him and they didn't depart. God has called us to diligently seek after him. He's called us to keep running the race, to keep going. Now, you're going to be tempted to think the opposite. You're going to be tempted to throw the towel in. I'm sure that many of these guys who are preparing for this game, you know, the game today is so polarized because of media. Um, they, they spend a whole week now at Radio's Row asking questions of these players and and some of these players, you know, they go from being paupers to being millionaires overnight. And some of them put their foot in their mouth. We realize that. Um, but again, there is a diligence that has been put into the game in order to get to the spot. And there is, a, there is also a purging process in their own life so that they could be of better use to the team. I may have shared this about a year ago with you, uh, my experience in one of our smaller group settings, but... Um, last year, I had the opportunity to go on the sidelines when the Giants were playing the Atlanta Falcons. And it was a great experience. I've done it several times. The only problem is, as a Giant fan, I had to be on the sidelines for the Falcons. And I couldn't root for the Giants. But that's okay. I was happy to be there. And it was an awesome experience. Now, my particular job was um, that the pitchers would come out. And even though they have these fancy tablets today, they always seem to break during the game. So a lot of teams still use the regular pitchers that they take. There's somebody taking pictures of every play. And so my job was to take the pictures of the defense over to the defensive coordinator. Now the defensive coordinator, he required that I would hold the book open as he would show the team the pictures as to what they were doing wrong or right. Now a couple of times I, I put the pictures upside down accidentally. Then it wasn't because I was trying to cause the Giants to win. It was just a mistake. It was an honest mistake. But I corrected that. And then when I went before the defensive coordinator and then the team, I'm holding the pitchers open to the secondary, and they had gotten beat several times. Um, Victor Cruz had gotten deep. A couple times Beckham had gotten deep on them. And so I had the book open, and this one cornerback then was getting called for holding. And he's yelling to the coach in a few other words he was saying, which wasn't Merry Christmas, I'll tell you that. And he's, I didn't, I didn't hold him, I didn't hold him. And now I'm holding the book, and the book shows that he's holding him. 
And so the coach circles him, holding him, and then the player looks at me like he wants to hit me. And I say, listen, I'm just the messenger here, okay? And the coach was just telling him, listen, you're holding and you need to fix this because you're hurting the team. And when I think of us and our walk with God, we could be of better use to God if we just look to God, we look to his leaders, we, we look to what he's saying, and if there's something that's circled that needs to be corrected, we could be of better use to his team. We could be of better use to, to winning what he has called us to do, which is to advance the cause of Christ. As we said earlier, to build more followers of Christ, to be and build followers of Christ. He's called us to do that. And we must realize that God wants us to maybe look at the things in our life that aren't right. And as he circles them, in order for us to diligently serve him, we need to make corrections. And so, as we do that, realize that as you are making those corrections in your life, and as God gives you blessings in your life and changes are made, you will still be tempted. You will still be tried by the enemy to think that you're insignificant. And I close with this story of a man by the name of Bill Bray, a Cornish miner who came to Christ all the way back in 1823 at the age of 29. He lived a life prior to coming to Christ of drunkenness and debauchery prior to his salvation. After coming to Christ, he became a tremendous example, a great witness by how he carried himself. No fluff and stuff, just a man of direct principle and of integrity, the complete opposite of what he used to be. Perhaps that's what made his witness so great. He became known, once a man who was always angry, became known as the glad man, God's glad man. Some time later, as he got older, he was digging in his garden. Uh, he had a potato garden. That's how he earned his living. And as he was digging, uh, he felt an oppression come over him from the enemy. It seemed to him that the devil was saying this, Bill Bray, God doesn't love you. If he did, he wouldn't give you such puny potatoes and so few potatoes to dig for your business. Now, after going to God in prayer to rid himself of that thought, he was reminded of all that God had entrusted him, including the privilege of serving him, which certainly wasn't small potatoes. You know, in this life, you have to realize that your greatest privilege is to serve God, to serve him by serving your family, to serve him by serving your church. You don't need to get your name in light. You don't need to write a book. Now, who cares about any of that stuff anyway? God knows who you are. God knows that you're being faithful right in your home, that you're taking care of that elderly parent, or that you're caring for your children, that you're that mom that's holding it all together, or you're that dad that's working multiple jobs, or you're that grandparent that's caring for your children, or you're that aunt or your uncle who's praying for your nieces and nephews and their parents to come to Christ. He knows who you are, and no faithful deed goes unnoticed by God Almighty. You keep diligently pursuing God. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. See, that's one of the biggest things that will knock you down and put you into survival mode is the lies that come from the enemy. But as we study the Gospels, we find out very clearly, my friends, very clearly, which are no small potatoes, by the way, that we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And we know the truth of God. The truth of God had been lost, as you saw in your outlines and from God's Word today. The truth of God had been replaced with false idolatry. I submit to you today, our problem in America isn't about a particular re Republican or Democratic or Independent Party. Our problem in America today is that we have misplaced the importance of God in our culture. In order to restore our culture, we must return to the God of heaven who has blessed our culture from its inception in our country. Uh, the best state of America is to be a state of America that is dependent upon God Almighty. And that's not something just to gain voter support from the evangelical or Roman Catholic bloc. That is a fact of life, that God is looking to bless people who diligently seek Him. Let us be a people who aren't looking to diligently remove God off of the dollar bill or from the capital. Let us be a people who are willing and diligently seeking the God of heaven and earth because America has been blessed because of God and our only shot to continue to be blessed is because of God. And we must never forget that. And we must never forget so great a salvation that God has given to us for this is the pathway to thriving. 
as we commit ourselves before God Almighty, it doesn't mean that all of the oceans that stand before us of our troubles are going to part, but it does mean that we will have faith to, to approach our Red Sea, trusting that the God of heaven will make a way in His time and according to His ways for His glory. And that, yes, we might lose a few battles along the way, but we know this much, God has already won the war, and anyway, the battle and the war belong to the Lord. King Josiah learned very early that there is a blessing in seeking God. Let that be said of us today, that there is no greater name to seek on the face of this earth than the name of Jesus Christ. Don't waste any more of your time than trusting in the one, the one and only, who has the ability to forgive sin, the one and only who defeated death and sin and rose from the dead and now sits at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. Josiah's life in many ways, like some of the other righteous kings, was a foreshadowing of the great king to come. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of lords and King of kings. The pathway of thriving is not just trusting in some religious jargon or hoping for some spiritual counterfeit experience. It's trusting in God Almighty, the concrete principles of God from His Word, Trusting in him no matter what lies ahead, diligently seeking God, and he promises to reward those who do so. If you believe that, say amen. amen. We're going to have now just a time of silent prayer. Listening to the Lord is so very important. Quiet your hearts now as we bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to come before the communion table in just a moment. And I want to give you this opportunity right now in the quietness of your own heart to just ask the Lord to search your heart, to try your heart, see if there's anything that needs to be confessed over to him. So very important to do so. Some of you may be saying, how do you receive communion? Well, those who believe in Christ can receive communion. And if you believe in Christ, ask God to search your heart of any sin that doesn't need to be there and confess it over to him. Maybe you have beef with somebody, give that over to him as well. Maybe you're holding a grudge, that's only going to dry you up even more, give that over to him as well. And approach this table, this beautiful table of God, that is a remembrance of that which we just talked about. As you come to seek the Lord through communion, ask him to search your heart. And so just take a few moments in the quietness of your own heart to pray, and then I will lead us as we partake of communion together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. Purge our hearts, O oh God. Purge our thoughts, O oh God. We confess our shortcomings and our sins before you, O oh God, our grudges and our gripes. We want to diligently follow you, O oh God, even here in communion, O oh God, as we partake. We want to correctly proclaim your death and resurrection till you return, O oh God. We want to seek you. We want to seek first your kingdom, O oh God, and your righteousness, trusting that you will add all these things that we need, O oh God. Forgive us, of, forgive us of our sins, O oh God. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. As we receive this communion today, we thank you, O oh God, for your mercies renew each day. And we commit these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray.